Skipster is the guest management platform used by top event teams for everything from guest lists to seating charts and online invitations. If you're looking for next generation event software that helps deliver perfect guest experiences, head over to Skipster's website. It's Skipster. Z K I P S T E R dot com to try a free event. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor in Chief Beth Kormanik. Welcome to Gather Geeks. David is away this week. Our guest today is Kevin Mignone, the founder and president of KM Productions, the New York-based audiovisual production firm with clients including Vogue, Jaguar, Tinder, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, along with many others he can't name because of non-disclosure agreements. KM Productions has also worked with BizBash on stage design and production at BizBash Live New York. Kevin started his business at the age of 13, and in this podcast, he's going to share his path as an event entrepreneur and how he knew he didn't want to be a DJ forever, as well as how social media is changing event lighting, how to deal with volatile clients, and his internal NDA policy for staff and how he regulates their posts even at public events. Let's take a listen. We're here with Kevin, and uh, he's got a very unique story. And before we get into the nuts and bolts of you know, festivals and AV and what people want, talk about how you became sort of this really kind of character in the New York <laughs> AV industry that has spilled over into everything else. And we even talked about um, food and wine and, and you're sort of a renaissance type of guy. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and, you know, it, this this world kind of came to me, uh, you know, as something I never knew existed and something I never expected to be in. Uh, you know, when I was 13, I had a business that started out of my dad's garage. You were 13 and you had a business? Yeah. Okay. Where were you? Uh, I was out on Long Island at my parents' home, uh, my dad's garage. And, you know, I pleaded and begged with my father for my 13th birthday to let me be a DJ and buy me a DJ sound system. Oh, you're one of them. Yeah, unfortunately, I did start as one of them. No, and uh, you know, I realized very quickly that the money is not in being the DJ and carrying your speakers around from country club to country club, but to actually hire a team to do the actual entertainment events for you and start to run the business. So within a couple of months, I had a few DJs working for me, and I had multiple sound systems going out doing three, four parties a weekend. And realized that from the management side of that, it gave me better perspective and ability to talk to the clients and open up my network to a larger bandwidth of people. Okay, so how old did you say you were? So the, the <laughs> my official first employee was when I was about 13 and a half. And were the, was that employee older than you? Oh, I mean, throughout and, my life and, until recently, every employee was always older than me. And how do you deal with employees that are older, with, uh, that take you seriously, that are, you know, when you're 13? Well, I mean, more often than not, uh, you believe it or not, even when I was 13, I, I was growing this beard. So yeah, we have, really we're, we're sitting to, here in our studio <laughs> with a, a long beard. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, er, early on, you know, having a much more mature attitude and a much more mature look to myself than the standard 13-year-old, I was able to pass off at least as slightly old enough to be able to tell these guys what to do. And then as they learned and understood how old I really was, I had already gained their respect. So it wasn't a, a major issue for me. So actually, before we get into everything else about your path, like, what leadership skills did you have at 13 years old that you knew that you can command attention of other people? For me, I, I understood at an early age that if I knew what I was doing, I should be strong and willing to be able to both communicate my needs and directions to people, as well as understanding when I don't know what I'm doing and defer to professionals that did. And I had a lot of mentors growing up who I kind of tagged on to and talked with a lot. And, you know, my family was not at all in the music business, but my father was an entrepreneur himself. He owned his own design business. So to have him as a mentor to me of how to run your own business, how to be responsible for your own self, help certainly carry that forward for me. At 13, was he the, the primary mentor? Uh, actually, no. Who was? Um, okay. My mentor growing up until I was about 12 or 13 was solely my father. Um, and then I actually, you know, and it's, 
I, I'd love to be able to mention him here. John sure. Smith, uh, who had worked at Farrelly Lighting and Audio, um, he was someone who I met and I had a ton at of respect thir- at for. At 13? Uh, yeah, about 12, 13 years so old. where did I, you meet him? I, my <laughs> father bought my first DJ system from the guys at Farrelly oh, Lighting and Audio, Sean okay. and Mike. Okay. So, I mean, it, it was, you know, easy for me to go into the back when my dad was out front helping me pick the sound system out and say, hey, you know, what the heck is this business that I'm getting into? What can you tell me about it? And John is, you know, uh, I mean, he's probably a 30 year veteran at this point in the business. He's a phenomenal audio engineer, probably one of the most brilliant repair technicians out there. And, uh, you know, he basically took me under his wing and taught me a lot about getting off the ground with this business and things to pay attention to and technologies and stuff like that, that I wasn't exposed to just starting up at 13. Okay. So what was the first thing that a 13 year old does when they start a business? I thought it was really cool. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, I got to DJ. My very first event was my dance at my uh, private school that I went to. So it, it was a middle school dance. And I convinced the teachers that even if I was awful, it was free. So I got the gig and I totally rocked it. I ended up being booked for every single dance from middle school to high school. Uh, And my parents belonged to a country club out on Long Island where they pitched the similar deal to say, hey, look, what's the worst that happens? My son's awful, but you get a free DJ. And they were a long term contract throughout the entire duration of my DJ business's existence. So what did you know at 13 in terms of uh, making people pleased with entertainment like what did they what did you feel that they wanted and what did you deliver that made it so that you got these rave reviews it really all came down to a same principle that we abide by today ensure that the client is happy keep a smile on their face give them everything that they want do not over promise and under deliver but what did, what about when you were in the public doing you know, a dj gig that made it so that the entire room felt that way as opposed to just the client, like what was was there a certain way that you did your music? Was there a certain sort of energy? Was there what was? I'm trying to find the magic here. Sure, I mean, my my mother was actually a dancer. She did like uh, very amateur dance competitions when she used to go to Fire Island when she was younger. So music was always a huge part of our family and in our home. So I had a huge variety of music that I already knew about and understood and was able to play into. So as a 13-year-old, I was able to do music from the 50s, music 60s, disco, Motown, modern day dance music, put it all into one package where I can play to an audience of any demographic or drop in things that are not part of their age group and have them love it because it was all about setting the tone for the night. So, okay, at 13, what were your big everybody in the dance floor songs? (laughs) Wow. Uh, I mean, guaranteed. Take take us down memory lane. Guaranteed winner, Moni Moni. Yeah. uh, Celebration. um, I mean, geez, there, there were so many amazing tunes back then that I could throw on, you know, and even with a younger crowd, you throw something really good from the 60s. If you've already got them on the floor, they're not leaving. Right. You know, and, and th- things from, you know, early 1990s, I- I'm sure you all remember like the now dance hits, music volume, whatever. I probably had disc one and two like at that point. And it's just I, I I look back at carrying around the boxes and boxes of CDs. No, I never played records. I was thankfully old enough not to have to. And just now it's like this guy shows up with a flash drive and he's got all of his music from all of his records and everything that he's ever played in his life. It's like, man, you have it way easier than I did. Okay. So now that we've sort of discovered 13 was uh, when you started your business, what did, what was 14 and 15 like? Uh, I, I really got sick of DJing fast. Um, as much as I loved that energy and being a part of creating the dance floor mood, it, it was just, it took me too far away from the client and didn't really let me socialize with the environment. And, and that was my big thing. I mean, I've always been able to sell and talk and be a part of something. So being stuck behind a, a DJ facade and, you know, speakers in a dance floor really didn't give me that opportunity to connect. So stepping outside from that, uh, you know, having that team to start doing the events for me was great, but I needed to go to something else. And at the time, my band was just starting to do its thing and needed a place to wait, play. Wait, 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 band? Yes. Okay, okay. Well, it's like <laughs> so, so just like every teenager, I dreamt of being a rock and roll star. 
summer yeah. and going out on tour and, you know, fast forward to the end of that career, realize that you really don't make any money playing your own music unless you're really lucky. Uh, but as my band needed a venue to play in, I found a local bar by my house called the Backstage in Woodmere. And they, you know, they had nothing going on on their Saturday nights. And I made them a business proposal at 15 years old to say, I'm going to take over your bar on Saturday night. I'm going to throw all ages rock shows. I ended up booking all the bands, promoting the shows, put up banners and flyers all over the neighborhood, all over the town, in the backstage itself, and used to run these shows with a door deal. And they got to keep the bar because I was too young to know I should have made a bar deal. And I got to keep half the door. And it was, for me, the opportunity to understand and invest in my first live sound system. And the ability to get to hear and work with a lot of different bands who were not that critical as I was learning. So I got to get my feet wet without the responsibility. So what was the next phase of this? You've already learned that DJing is not where it's at and being in the band is not where it's at. How, and we're going to get to AV and staging and all that. But what was the next um, part of your journey? So the next part was I started working in nightclubs and trying to be the technician at nightclubs thinking, why do I need to be the guy on the stage? Why am I not the guy for the people on the stage? And being able to take a step back and say to myself, all right, my band can only play so many days or I can only DJ so many days. What if I was doing sound for all of the days that anyone wanted to play and stepping into a role of a, a nightclub audio engineer? Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a job at uh, an old nightclub on Long Island called Ritual. And they would hire me to bring in my sound system and mix for their live band shows. And it started becoming, and you know, it, was, it was a quick understanding to me that this is where the money's at. So you still weren't able to drink. <laughs> I worked for many years in this business, not legally being able to drink. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I actually had my 21st birthday party at a nightclub to be unnamed for the sake of their SLA license, um, where I used to have a couple of drinks here and there when I was you know, working events or I was off on weekends that I actually wasn't working. And I had my 21st birthday there and I came in and the, the hostess who always knew me, always took care of us, said, what are you guys doing out here? What's going on? I was like, oh, it's my birthday. She's like, great. Congratulations. What birthday? I was like, uh, 21. <laughs> and so that, <laughs> that was an interesting conversation. Yes. So what did you learn working in that world, in the nightclub world that, that you actually learned that you kept from today that you, that you would be as a lesson from today? Uh, I understood that no matter what your environment, the client still expects the same level of execution, the same level of professionalism, whether it's a nightclub, a festival, a private event for you know the highest level of personnel you could ever dream of working with. Everyone just wants the same thing, a smooth operation, an easy task, an easy day, no stress. And I learned to deliver on all fronts with that. So how did you um, build your intellectual capital and to, you had to you had to figure all this stuff out, and you didn't go to school to do it. You were learning on the job. But what did you do? Like, how did you how did you figure all this out as a kid at seventeen? And what drove you to do it? I'm trying to sort of make this a lesson for other people that are listening. If they want to get into any business, what sure, uh, what, what was the technique that you used? So honestly, my technique is absolutely learning on the streets. It was talking to people, aligning myself with people who were already doing some fashion of this already, whether they own their own business or they were just their own person doing a job. There were a lot of lighting designers and lighting operators and audio engineers who I became very quickly friends with because I was some 16, 17, 18 year old kid who was, you know, no threat to them. So they had open availability to have conversations with. And it gave me the, the opportunity to learn from some of the greatest people in this business who are maybe not even around these days. But do you get a sense, would you advise another person at that age to maybe be that, that not quite annoying, but cute person that's, that's asking all the questions because you're like, you're, it sounds like you were thirsty for information. I mean, anyone in this business who is unwilling to teach the next group of people coming up. I mean, not to be too harsh, but I don't have much respect for that person. Right. Because all, all we can do is stay on top until someone like me comes up behind us and does it better. But that person like you, you recognize that person like you. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, of Kevins out there now. Oh, yeah. That are, are, you know, very, very excited to want to learn. 
And I try and employ them all. Yeah. <laughs> well, we haven't got to that yet. Okay, so we're at 17, 18, 19, right? Okay. You, you're, in the rest, you're in the nightclub business. How did you break out? Uh, so at 21 I, or whatever. I was fortunate enough to have two DJs trust very much in me and uh, a nightclub promotion group that trusted very much in me as well. Um, I'm sure everyone remembers Jonathan Peters, the Sound Factory superstar. Uh, he, through his former lighting programmer, Tim Shackney, had given me the opportunity to do his booth monitor upgrade at the Roxy downtown. I came in and I did a mobile sound system for a pre-existing nightclub that needed additional sound reinforcement, something I had never heard of in my life for this type of situation. Um, shortly thereafter, Boris's team, uh, you know, Crowbar resident for however long Crowbar, Crowbar. was in business, yeah, yeah. Um, and his managers, uh, Dennis the Menace and John Paul, had asked me to do this thing down at the Sagamore in Miami Beach for a winter music conference. So, of course, you know, I'm... I'm a go-getter. I'm going to say yes if I believe that I can get it done, get a contract, and then go figure out how to get it done. So the figuring out how to get it done, how do you do that? Like, how did, what, do, what do you do? Like, okay, I can do this. I can do anything. What? I'm really fortunate. Um, in the beginning, I had a lot of really good luck, really good opportunities come my way that I was able to make investments with the money that I was making at a young age with very little overhead. Uh, you living. were making a good, good living. I, I was living off of this business from about 16 on. I bought my first car with it. I bought multiple cars thereafter with it um, you know, and basically supported a lifestyle of a really elaborate teenager in high school and when I should have been in college. It, it gave me the freedom to both experience things very early on in life and not get tied down to things that seem to me like a waste of going to a, a formal education place like a college where I couldn't really spend time learning my trade. I had to spend time learning things in English textbooks and, and things that weren't focused on what I was already doing. Okay. So you, I'm trying to tra understand the life of this entrepreneur. You were obviously a, an entrepreneur from day one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would uh, say. And, uh, <laughs> even younger than starting my own DJ business, if I found an opportunity to set up a stand in front of my parents' house and sell something, I did. Okay, uh, go give us a little. Let's do a side trip here. <laughs> uh, lemonade. What did you sell? I, I, I mean. I was the epitome of snowballs in a blizzard. I, I, I would set up a lemonade stand or I would sell water balloons in the water balloon flight, fight down at the school or, you know, come up with some way to have a, a fundraiser at my high school, uh, at my lower school at the time. And I was always proactive in, you know, coming up with ways to generate additional press and additional interest in things at a young age. So to me, I was born a salesman and I was born a salesman with integrity because I grew up with a father who really valued the life that he was able to lead by starting his own business. He, he went to Cooper Union and he, he did all the, you know, the design school, the trade schools, all that and started his own business and was part of a lot of the development of a lot of cigarette brands and Laurel Art companies and, and people of that nature. And when I was, you know, a, a early teenager, I would go to his office on Park Avenue and help him box up posters for Chase Bank and print and cut flyers. So it's, it's all about the work you put into it. So to me, I just wanted to put every bit of myself into everything that I did always because I knew the results were always going to be the best they could be if I gave it my all. Okay, so that's the side trip. Now we know you're a total entrepreneur. I'm going to ask you down the road, how do you recognize that trait in others? But let's first go through your journey of you're 21, you're at the Roxy, you're doing all that. Where, where did you sort of pivot into your own brand? Well, so my brand truly was titled KM um, right around the same time I went to the Winter Music Conference. I was, and you know, now this is going to be public information, I was once Neon Nitro Entertainment because that's what I thought was cool at 13 when I started a <laughs> DJ business. Neon Nitro. Um, and you very quickly get out of that when you start working at metal clubs and working for DJs in the larger picture. Um, so KM Productions launched and went down to Miami for Winter Music Conference that year. We... We very much in the same capacity as we do today, anything that anyone needed done while we were down there, we made it happen. Whether it was last minute booth monitors at a venue that popped up or someone needed CDJs somewhere that they didn't have them and thought they did, we got in our truck and ran it there. And the very first journey to Winter Music Conference that I did was with my father as a co-pilot. 
the bar back from a nightclub I was working at the week before and the car trailer that I went out and bought the weekend before I was leaving because I realized it wouldn't fit in my pickup. So then you went down to Miami. And then we went down to Miami. how long were you there? Uh, we were down there for a little over a week. Uh, did the event at the Sagamore Hotel. Uh, loaded it all out. And every DJ wanted to get down on what KM was doing. Everybody who was playing in New York and, and not necessarily. Was, uh, explain to everybody what that means. Like what were you doing that was, so, that was unique we were in, able, Eng- in English? Sure. <laughs> we were able to supplement existing nightclubs with heightened performance audio gear. So it sounded better. And not necessarily every club needed a better sound, but maybe not every club was built for the event that they were doing. So we would come in and give them either frontal reinforcement if the DJ was playing on stage or give them a four corner stack if that's what they needed for the day. Uh, I mean, we worked in, you know, Little Brazil, basically, in Newark, New Jersey, with Mario Caligari back in the day. And we would take a parking lot and turn it into a a nightclub for the afternoon. And things like that helped me sort of understand how the little thing that I had started with DJing parties or DJing nightclubs was easily expandable into larger scale, larger sized venues and understanding how to create that scale when someone was willing to take a chance on me. It gave me a lot of flexibility to to learn on job. So, but it sounds like that you also, if you were in like the perfume business, uh, you would have had this incredible nose. <laughs> it sounds like you had incredible ears uh, yeah, to I understand mean, sound. My trade, yeah. I was an audio engineer. Yeah. I could mix anybody, you know, polish any turd, so to say, uh-huh. and, and make music out of nothing if need be. And I, I got aligned with John Smith, actually, with his Smith Pro Audio brand from the start. Uh, you know, really the first significant amount of speaker cabinets that I ever bought were from him and started a sound business and started buying mixing consoles and microphones and DJ equipment. And that started the first beast that outgrew the garage, turning around and going from six tops and six subs to 16 tops and 16 subs and 12 CDJs and amp racks after amp racks. It, it, it very quickly becomes the same story I'm in today where you feed the beast and inevitably the beast gets bigger so you need more food. Building a memorable experience for your guests means planning every detail right. Skipster is the guest management platform designed to help you create the perfect experience from impressive online invitations to seamless check-in at the door. Get started at Skipster, spelled Z-K-I-P-S-T-E-R dot com for a free test event. Okay, so as we feed the beast, you're you're leaving Florida. Like, give us the give us a little bit bigger chunks now. Now you're an adult. You're in your twenties. What was your first break from from the music festival, the the Miami um, experience, to your first big um, explosion in? in uh, I mean, there there are a lot of things that aligned at similar times to give me the opportunity that I had, and the nightclub world paved the way for a lot of it um, as the nightlife scene and the DJs I, were work- I was working with were getting bigger. Also, bigger DJs were showing interest in what I was doing and I'm trying to understand who this new guy is on the market. And same thing for nightclubs. Who, who's this guy who's been doing all of these shows in New York? Let's, let's get him to Jersey. Let's get him to Boston. Let's get him to other places and use what he's got. Uh, at that time, as the next big pivotal, pivotal moment in my career, I made an investment in the L Acoustic brand of speakers, and it changed a lot of the life of what KM was doing because now, for the first time, I had something that was not only able to be rented in if I needed more, but able to be rented out as an additional flow of revenue. So now, other people in the business had the same gear as me, so I became a part of the business rather than an island creating a business. And that connected me to a lot of other businesses and companies that were 20, 30 years my senior who were interested in just like me talking and learning more about one another. And, you know, the guys at ESP Eastern Stage out in uh, out on Long Island, I mean, Bill and and Glenn and, and Steve, those guys were a huge part of education for me as well. And they're they're like me. They they believe in the education side of it and they taught me a lot of things. And as the years progressed, we we collaborated and talked about a lot of other 
investments and values of growing in gear that was happening. And so was the business, the business kind of was a gear business for a while, but your added value was putting it together. Exactly. And so that's your, where your margins are not, you're not a commodity, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and so tell us, you know, how, did, how did you grow? Just give us the sort of the high points of how you grew to not where you are today, but like the next pivotal moment. Yeah, uh, you know, again, it was it was a lot of luck in meeting people, and well, you people... make your own luck though too. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I'm able to talk to someone on the human level, and not necessarily just be an automated response from a sales coach. So, in meeting people, whether it be out in nightlife or additional people in the business who are on the same or slightly more elevated paths that I was on. People just grew to trust me, right. and trust became the most important part of my business. If you look back at the entire 21 years that I've been in business, I've probably properly advertised maybe 12 times. Of course, with business. We are <laughs> all yeah. word of mouth. Yeah. People trust yeah. us. They understand what we do and the product that we offer. Do you? How do you see the entire business? I mean... You're sort of like the guys that make stuff happen where an event organizer is the person that says, okay, we got to make stuff happen, but then they have to find the people that do the plumbing and do and, and make it happen. Do you see those people working together still or is it two separate worlds? Well, there are a lot of people in the industry who don't believe in the team spirit or don't quite understand how to get to that level. Um, and maybe it's from a lack of trust. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people out there who don't do it the way we do it, who are looking for the next grab, the next opportunity to step on someone and get a, a foot taller. For me, I've always stood by building partnerships. Every single solitary event client, small little cable rental for me is not a transaction in the register. Every single bit of business that we do builds a relationship. We are a relationship-based company. So for me, if you're calling me today to rent XLR cable for some event that you didn't realize you hadn't, you didn't have enough cable for, a year from now, you may be a guy renting 50 lights from me or a yeah, but guy you're, calling But also me, you're going to be the guy that comes to you and says, how do I use these lights better? Exactly. Uh, and we, I do my best to stay above or on the line of everything new that's coming out. I'm not the the guy waiting around with lights from ten years ago or speakers from just ten years money ago. On the lights. Yeah, I mean, I I invest in my company beyond everything else. It is about the growth and the future and keeping this business at the top and on the cutting edge. Where's the difference between the newest and the best and or the or the new shiny object? Like, how do you sort of balance those? You know, I wanted the whiz bang thing, but you know, it's just another shiny object. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of risk in that too. You know, there's a lot of things that I like and I think are super cool, but nobody else wants them. So a little bit of it is trial and error, grabbing, you know, a couple of these X's and seeing if people like them. And if they do, you buy four dozen more. And if I buy a Y and no one likes a Y, then you don't buy anymore and it becomes a thing, you know? Okay. So tell us today, what does your business look like? So now, 21 years later <laughs> from, did you count it from 13? From 13, okay. 21 years later, yeah. okay. 34, um, running, running. Hmm. I would say lucky to be a part of a great team that's developed over the past 21 years and watching that growth spawn into people who are equally as invested in KM as I am and watching people enjoy the success of their work and mentoring those who started with me with no knowledge who are some of my best guys today. I, I have a guy on my team who everybody at BizBash definitely knows, Maxwell. Yep. He came to me as a guy who helped out on a job one day in upstate New York. He had done some AV in college, but he was basically cleaning and making fish tanks. He came to me as a kid to do some extra jobs, learned his way through almost everything he knows today in my door, and now is one of the top people on my sales team. So who is your ideal client? If you can pick your client, like what kind, is it the organizer? Is it the production company that, are, where are you in the supply chain, which is always moving around too? Well, my favorite part of KM is that 
we're not locked into one style or one favorite. I love the fact that we can go from a festival client, an artist playing a festival directly, or a private event organizer, or some private clients who just are our clients since day one. And I get to be a part of all sides of it, get to experience all sides of it. We never get stale of, you know, too many weddings or too many festivals or downtime because festival season's over. I really enjoy the fact that we get to experience it from all sides. And and the, the party planner, event organizer, event producer world is great. Some of our, our partners that we go into events with, it's a true partnership and a family where there is not a time where you'll see my guys sitting around when someone else needs help. We have carried furniture into a dinner area because the designer is running behind schedule or we've grabbed ladders and help hang fabric. We'll, we'll load in or load out anything because when it comes down to it, the event's success is on all of us, whether it was my job or their job. If the client's not happy... I'm also not well, getting the work again. Well, it goes back to your philosophy. However, like you have also, so you, we decided the DJ business is not the only place to be, that the being in the, in the rock and roll world needs to be expanded. <laughs> what do you see today? I mean, you guys are getting into staging, you're getting into the entire presentation, you're getting into everything. Where are we going and where should we be going? Uh, I think the, the inevitability of more one-stop shops is is coming more and more to a head. The, the people who specialize in one thing, obviously, if they've been around for a long time and they are you know professionals and specialists in it, they'll still get their jobs and they'll still keep their clients who, who keep them open. But these newer clients coming into the table are all asking for one phone call, one invoice. A lot of them we can be transparent with and say, hey, we don't do that, but we have a trusted partner and they trust in us which is what I try and project on all our clients is trust. You can ask me to do anything. I'm going to tell you if I do it or if I sub it out, but either way, it's under my umbrella and it's under my protection. So, okay, so let me ask you, you're dealing with all these different clients. Everybody wants a one-shop deal. Where should today's event organizer be putting their money? in terms of an experience? Like what you see at all, is it the staging? Is it the lighting? Is it the content? Is it like, what do you see? You, you, you have the ability to sort of like see it and you can be eye rolling at what they do, or you can actually <laughs> sort of say, you know, this is what I see people liking. Like you just like you picked the DJ and you knew what music got people on the dance floor. Like what motivates and moves and captures the attention of audiences today? You know, that's a hard, a totally hard question. It's a hard statement to be blanket about totally. or, or more so to direct at. Um, for me, I always encourage people to take into account everything. Don't just say, I need moving lights on my dance floor for when people dance. Well, that's, that's great. But when they're sitting at their tables and the tables are dark, or if you've brought in plants and trees and foliage and gardens to your tent, that has to look cool too. Like don't, don't just focus on one element, create an experience. It, it's really to me about not missing an opportunity. But where do you put your budget? Like where do, do you, like is it, if you have a limited budget, is, is it the visual presentation that becomes, I know that it's, this could be anything. So I'm trying to get what's in your brain about. It's the environment. So you if, think if you're looking lighting for the, one the word, trees. I, I think if you're on a tight budget, just pay attention to your environment and do everything within that sparingly. Do a small amount of audio, but make sure it covers the environment and the energy you're looking to portray. If your environment is a candlelit dinner in a venue, focus on making that look beautiful and don't spend a ton of money doing other things. It, to me, every single event, whether it's 100,000 people at a festival or 20 people in a private dinner, the environment makes an event and environments encapsulate everything that all of our clients and we do. It's the decor, it's furniture, it's candles, it's colors, it's lights, it's sound. It, don't overdo it. Don't try and just spend money for the sake of spending money. Pay attention to the scene you're setting. What about that temporary environment that makes people like you're, you're moving into something that you've never seen. You're bring, you're carrying people into a, a temporary environment 
and it has to do with every part of the senses. How do you, um, I mean, are you still jaded? Are you jaded about that still? But you go in and you see incredible things. How do you see it? You're in the business. Like when you go into a room, like, are you like cynical about it or are you just say, Oh, this works. I'm not yet jaded. Okay. Um, it's definitely on the horizon a little <laughs> bit. Um, I definitely have a hard time going to any concert that I'm not producing because instead of sitting there enjoying my favorite artist or enjoying whatever's happening on stage, I'm sitting there listening to if I can hear the violin enough or looking and wondering why that light fixture is slightly out of center. And it, you know, it's, it's more so the perfectionist in me that starts to get the jaded features in, in my personality to say that, you know, I can't even sit back and enjoy another show because I'm treating it as if it's mine and why it's well, not done perfectly. You know, when BizBash, even when we do an event, it's like, holy crap, <laughs> we got all these people looking at everything that we're doing because they're all making the judgments. Yeah. And so we try, we can't try as hard as we, we can't please everybody. Oh, no. And you man. also can't be over the top to the point where you're trying to make a statement that just won't work because we don't have necessarily the budget to do it properly. Yeah, I mean, it, that that goes back to what I was saying is just don't spend money just to spend money. Do what you need to do to make that environment come together and be comfortable for your audience. How has uh, social media changed what you do from – you're 21 years old, so half of the, <laughs> half of, half of the time there was no social media. I only got Facebook when I was 23. So. <laughs> exactly. What, has that changed how you design sound or visuals or staging? in an event today? Yeah. I mean, especially on the corporate side of things, uh, brand events, it's, I hate to say it, but it's really not about the event anymore. It's about the photos for two or three years after the event. How did it look on Instagram? What did that person look like when they stood in front of that wall and took a selfie where we're paying attention to lighting and visual aesthetic for the long term use. It's no longer, just about how cool or how great it looked in here. And I'm finding that some events are becoming a little overlit to compensate for that. Maybe they're a little too bright just to make sure that your camera phones are, you know, able to capture the image that well. It, it's, it's a delicate balance, making sure that the, the archive of Instagram stays up to date, but also you're creating the right environment for people. Do you think people are too busy capturing and not attending? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, you, you sort of see it. Yeah. yeah. We've, uh, noticed, we've noticed, actually, we did a survey 10 years ago on guests behaving badly. <laughs> and, and, you know, people were having, behaving badly. But now that they have so much to do at an event, they behave better <laughs> because they're not stealing the food and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it goes both ways. It's, you know, they're either so immersed in their phones that they're not paying attention to the event right there in front of them or... You know, maybe people are not having fun because they're worried it's going to end up on Instagram tomorrow. Yeah. You know, there and of course there's a line to how much fun you can have, but some of the best events that I've done are the ones I can't talk about because everybody there wasn't allowed to have a cell phone or respected the fact that this was their private event. You know, I mean, we've done, you know, everything in every state that maybe made the news, but hopefully didn't. And that's some of the coolest work, being able to create a once in a lifetime experience. Give us an example of something that you can't talk about. That I, you don't have to mention names. Like what, what was the setting? The, 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 uh, the depth of my NDA clause, <laughs> both internally and externally, is something I am not willing to uh, break. It is the NDA standard operating procedure now with many clients? Well, so internally, because of the level of client that we work with and the magnitude of some of the events that we get to be placed on, I have a very detailed and very strict internal non-disclosure social media policy with all of my staff. Um, period, end of story, you can't post, you can't take photos. On a public event, something that's publicly ticketed that anyone can walk up to, take all the photos you want do not post without approval from our social media team because maybe, yeah, it's our event that we produced and worked on publicly, but 
maybe we're not the top line of the invoice. Maybe we're supporting another production company. And that's, that's something else that's really changed our business as well as a lot of these other production companies out there who want our gear or need our gear and love working with our people, but need it to be white label, wear them that day. And having those partnerships is great for us. And I don't really at this point care whose name's on the box and who's getting the credit. I like being a part of the events and having the experiences that come with them. How do, how do you uh, view the, the agency world? I mean, it, it sounds like a lot of times an agency it does the intellectual capital piece and then they hire someone out else to execute everything pretty much. Is that, or that's kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, too. I, yeah. I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean to be quite Frank, I, I like the liability. It's you want me to design and produce that? Cool. This is your concept. Great. I'll see you there with the equipment. All the client facing liability off my shoulders. I build what they tell me to build and it's built. Mm-hmm. It's nice once in a while. I don't know if I like the robotic production 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but it's a really good break from it to be able to build someone else's creation just the same. So, from an, so an agency gives you a call. And you're acting now as a full production company for them, I guess, right? Most or, of the time, or, yeah. Or, or, and the AV side too, but you're doing, you're kind of partnering and. Right. Are you honchoing it or you, do you take charge of it pretty much if, if the client, if that's the direction? I take the role Can they you? need me to take. But is that, is that what's happening to, I'm trying to figure out. Like what it's is a, happening split. today? There's some companies who hire the technical staff that is proficient enough to manage and execute the event with the assistance of our support team and our equipment. There's also a handful of clients who are really good salespeople who don't understand what to do next. And it's a partnership for us. We right. come in there under their umbrella, give them every level of coordination, technical directors, producers that they need and execute an event for them. Right. And there's a couple of clients where they're basically just the name on top of an invoice and we've done everything. Yeah. And you know, there's that other layer where we're just a gear house. Yeah. But you know, what I find we, so we've been working with you on our shows, you're the savior ass guys <laughs> 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 because when you're up against it, if yeah. you guys don't know what you're doing, we're dead. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that is what I find is like when you say trust, to me, that's the killer thing that we get or any client gets. And for me, the, it's still the heartbeat of the business too. Like yeah. 90% of our clients, especially our regular client base, have my cell phone number and they're texting me, calling me or emailing me all hours of the day and night. And unless I am in a coma from a loadout, I'm answering you. How do you deal with, how do you, this is a, a, for everyone else too. How do you stay cool when somebody's hot? Like, what do you do? Do you stay cool when somebody's hot? You can ask any one of my staff. If my voice is elevated or any sort of agitated frustration, something is oh so badly wrong that everyone should be running. Uh I'm not that guy. Uh I'm not the angry screamer, stressor. I I keep it cool because as soon as you start letting other emotions take take weight on your ability to solve a problem, you're not solving that problem. So how do you deal with the hot person that hires you because sometimes clients suck. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Uh, but how do you how do you how do you deal how do you deal with what do you just sort of what's your technique? It's like, "Hey, hey dude, take you know, it all in." Or do you, or do you sort of like you tell them or do you confront in a nice way or like how do you bring someone back to earth? I'm a pretty good judge of character. Yeah. So, right from the start in meeting someone, I can tell if that's just who they are, and if that's who they are, You'll you just have it. to go with it. Okay. Just take it let it jump right over your back, go away. They need a yell to make themselves feel good. So you let, it happen. you let it happen. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're not going to change somebody. So you don't let your ego get out of the way? No. Okay, good. Not at all. Okay, so I want to end on one, the last question is, how do you recognize the Kevins that you see out there? Like, how do you know there's another Kevin that's 13 years old that wants to be like, that's like you, that you want to hire and you think this guy's going to be great or person or woman? There's a handful of people who either still work for me now or worked for me at some point where the moment I met them, they just had this spark. They have a trait or a mannerism about them that I can just tell this guy's got something. 
that something is not always the something I thought it was, but there's something in there. And, and I'm also very clear in the hiring process. And <laughs> this has sort of been my age old mentality. And I say to someone, is there anything else that you love doing more than this? And if they say yes, then I tell them it's the wrong business for them wow. because this is not at all sex, drugs, and rock and roll. This is feeder cable, porta potties, and rain gear. Like there is no glory. There is no, you know, big, high and mighty throne that you sit on at some point. You need to love every second of this business because every day that it's exciting and energizing and fun, it's grueling, it's exhausting, it's punishing. So if someone can love it and at a young age be interested in learning more about all of what we go through in a weekend or a week or a month or a season, they've got something about them. And they don't always turn out to be producers or audio engineers or lighting designers. Some of them get this under their belt and run away and become technical directors for these agencies because now they have a captive knowledge of this piece, but they don't want to get their hands dirty. And I don't blame them. Yep. I mean, you're coming down to passion. Yeah. I mean, it comes down to passion. I always do this survey before whenever I speak, how many people love their job? Every <laughs> hand goes up in our industry because we are in a place where people actually do like what they do. Oh, yeah. Um, and you don't if exactly they don't choose to do this. Yeah, exactly. It chooses you. Exactly. On that note, thank you, Kevin. Uh, this has been oh, very you. eye-opening, and I hope that the young people, the young Kevins of the future will somehow find this and be motivated <laughs> to do whatever they love. Thanks, Kevin, for joining us on Gather Geeks. See the company's work on Instagram at, at KM Productions NY or on the Event Innovation Forum stage at BizBash New York on October 23rd. Register to attend at bizbashlive.com. One more plug for today. We have just released our 2019 list of the top 100 events in the U.S. There are several new events on this year's list, which highlights the best trade shows, benefits, tech events, festivals, parades, and holiday events, and more. We work hard on this and do a lot of research and talking with experts before choosing and ranking events, but our opinions may differ from yours. We would love your feedback as well. So find this list on bizbash.com or on our many social feeds where you can leave us your comments. Thanks today to our Gather Geeks producer, Dave Nelson, our editorial liaison, Claire Hoffman, and our VP for production and client services, Rebecca Pappas. We'll be back next week. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a reading and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on.